to explore why we have chosen um, the topic of, of this session. It's really come out of a range of different things. So when we were working with many members of the network on General Comment 21 back five, six years ago and, and talked to children, their relationship with the police was a critical thing that got raised in those consultations by street connected children. Um, and uh, that led to us uh, creating the Legal Atlas for Street Connected Children, which focuses on three areas. It focuses on status offences, so uh, offences where you're criminalised for kind of who you are as opposed to the act you have done. Um, uh, your status is what is criminalised, and that puts uh, Street Connected Children in particular position to the police. We also focused on police roundups and laws around that. And then the third area was around legal identity, which obviously also makes children more vulnerable if they don't have legal identity. But we continue to hear from members of the network around the impact of their the relationship between children and the police as being a key area of concern. It came up in our network survey. It's come up when we've done calls for evidence for submissions to the UN. And it's come up uh, where individual organizations have uh, canvassed uh, experiences from children um, in terms of uh, sexual and uh, physical abuse. So it continues to be a very live issue. And tomorrow we're doing a session, uh, which is actually one of our most popular sessions has been brilliantly signed up to um, with members of the network sharing their experiences of positively engaging with the police because there are as Cedric said before we came into the conversation they're too rare but there are really great examples of organizations who've been able to take constructive steps to engage with um, their police locally which is really the, the focus of that session but today we're going to zoom back out a bit and Cedric's going to look at it from a little bit more of a global perspective could you do the next slide Ellie before before I jump in and um, and ask Cedric um, for his opinions, I just wanted to mark the fact that um, we've named the this little point in our network forum where we bring in an ex external speaker, the Roger Hayes and Maggie Eels uh, lecture. Um, this is actually in a dialogue format, but we're still calling it our lecture. Um, and this is a picture of Roger. He uh, generously supported us for many years um, and. Unfortunately, both Maggie and Roger died um, separately, but not, not long distance from each other. And they both wanted to continue the work that all of you do with Street Connected Children. It was something they really cared about. And um, one of the things that we promised them we would do was continue to have this moment at our network forums. So just I wanted to take this moment just to mark and thank both Roger and Maggie for their support to the Consortium for Street Children. Great. Could we go on to, I don't know if you've got a holding slide or if you just want to frame into our Sally, uh, maybe you just want to frame into the two of us. Wonderful. Um, so uh, maybe just to kick us off, Cedric, maybe you could just start by telling us a little bit about the Global Initiative on Justice with Children um, and what that's about and help um, put it in the context of, of today's dialogue. Yes. Thank you, Pia. Thank you for the invitation first. And uh, it's a pleasure to, to speak to and to meet you and, and speak with, uh, with your network and that I've heard about the network many times and a very good uh, in a very positive way. So I'm very happy to, uh, to meet uh, some of you today. So I work for a foundation called uh, Terre des Hommes. Terre des Hommes is a Swiss organization, mainly a humanitarian organization. We work in 45 countries all over the world. Um, but um, we developed in uh, 2019, um, uh, during the 30th anniversary of the uh, Convention of the Rights of the Child, a global initiative on justice with children. So the global initiative is led by Terbism with two other organizations, Penal Reform International, based in UK, and uh, the International Association of uh, Youth and Family Judges and Magistrates. And all together, what we try to do is to keep uh, the momentum on child justice in the international agenda. So we, we work uh, basically uh, around um, two... Um, uh, milestone events, which are the uh, um, World Congress on Justice uh, with Children, 
uh, that are organized every five years, more or less. The last one was in uh, online due to COVID. We forgot that we had COVID, but uh, life was different in 2021. Uh, and we organized uh, the World Congress at that time with more than 5,000 participants on discrimination. And we tackle a lot of topics regarding to um, the, the, the subject of today, uh, child discrimination in access to justice, uh, and in particular, uh, in contact with the police. The next one, if uh, you allow me to uh, uh, to inform the, the, the audience, the participant, the next one will be in Madrid, will be a hybrid. Um, and we'll focus on violence against children in the administration of justice, which I think we'll have, uh, we will have a lot of things to say as well when uh, the children are in contact with the police uh, system as well. Uh, so the Global Initiative, it's um, um, an advocacy, let's say, movement, uh, advocacy and research uh, around child justice. And we focus our activities um, around different topics such as uh, uh, digital justice, uh, community empowerment, in particular uh, with um, customary justice, for instance, uh, which is a, a topic of interest for plenty of countries uh, all over the world, uh, climate justice uh, and, uh, and others. And I will be happy to, uh, to share with you, Pia, uh, the more information about the, um, the initiative and all that we produce. We just launched um, a few uh, weeks ago uh, a paper on uh, climate injustice for children. Uh, and we tackled the, the right of children for peaceful assembly and how they are criminalized in different countries as well. I can, I can continue doing hours about what I do, you know, so you should stop me there. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering if before we go more deeply into, into kind of issues around working with the police and law enforcement, I just wondered if you could kind of reflect a little bit on that overlap of agendas between some of those broad access to justice agendas that you've talked about with the work of our network, which is, you know, uh, many, many organizations who are mainly working at quite a grassroots level with street connected children and kind of where you see, I mean, in some senses, you could say, well, of course, there's overlap on all the issues, but where you think there's the most interesting and relevant kind of overlaps between those two broad agendas. Yeah, so that, that is a very good question. You know, um, I like this very simple uh, sentence from Renate Winter. She used to be the uh, the former president of CRC. We used to say for those questions, what do you think about this kind of kids uh, in, in, in opposition with this kind of kids, et cetera, you know? And she always say, children are children. And I think with this simple sentence, there is a perfect um uh taste of what i mean when i say that uh child justice apply to all children so not only children in conflict with the law but children can be victim children who can be accused children who can be uh, witnesses or children who are in contact with uh, the justice system because they are uh, you know uh, in need of care and protection that the case of three children what I found interesting with child children is depending where you are on the globe, you have different, let's say, expression of what it is to be a child uh, as with children. In Europe, you will understand it mainly, uh, not only, but a lot uh, through the concept of uh, children uh, on the move, migrant children. Uh, that will be perhaps um, wrongly, but that will be a lot, uh, the first way people will think when they hear about children. When you go to the States, it's about homelessness directly. Uh, so we have different perspective, but the, the question is, what is happening to those kids who are on the street on a daily basis and are at risk of being in conflict with the law just by the state who they are? And they directly enter in my category. So unfortunately, we are not good enough in our societies to consider children as victims first. We consider them as, most of the time, uh, as, um, 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 you know, uh, uh, subject, not of right, but subject of obligation. Mm -hmm. And children in the street are not there because they are chosen to be in the street. It's a lot of um, elements will bring them to those uh, um, circumstances. Great, thank you. 
And then kind of move, moving us to the topic of, of working with the with the police, maybe you could kick us off by just talking about what child-friendly policing means and why it's significant and particularly within the current kind of global political landscape, giving us some yeah. thoughts on that. Yeah, sure. Um, so what do we mean by child-friendly police? That's something that we've been starting to work about um, since a few years now, since the last World Congress in 2021. Um, this concept of, you know, in, in, in uh, access to justice, we speak a lot about child-friendly justice system, so a system which are actually adapted to, uh, to, um, to children. But we try with all the events happening all over the world, uh, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement, et cetera, what we try to figure out is is can we adapt a similar way of thinking to other systems such as the police system? So what we understand by child-friendly police is a system, uh, is a police system where children are treated fairly, appropriately, and without causing harm, which is, I mean, that should be the basic, right? Um, but we still need to do some policy paper to explain why it is important, unfortunately. And as I say, children can be in contact for the police for all the reasons I just explained, victim, witnesses, uh, or, or accused of crime. I will say it's important to have this concept of child-friendly police for two main reasons, not, that, uh, not the only one, but two main uh, one. The first one is because children are different from adults. That is obvious, um, but in the in the con in in reality, it doesn't seem to be so uh, clear for all the professional. Children are different from adults emotionally and um, biologically and um, psychologically. They don't have the same degree of maturity as an adult which means that they do not understand the consequences of their act in the same way than adults. But that means as well, they are at risk, higher risk of exploitation, of abuse by police, uh, as well as uh, uh, staff uh, from the justice system. That can bring them uh, to um, stigmatization and having lasting impact effect on their development. Uh, and of course, uh, consequences of a degree of rehabilitation and reintegration uh, into the society. Another point which I think are, um, very, uh, is very important is that the police is the door, the main door, the first door, the entry point to the justice system. That's the first contact. And we forgot about that. That way we spend a lot of time training judges, training lawyers. We work with the justice system, law reform, etc. But we don't spend enough time in working in the police. They are mm. the first one. They can do a lot at the beginning. And uh, unfortunately, above all, with marginal uh, children uh, from marginalized uh, background, we report a lot of negative experience during this first interaction with the law enforcement, which bring um, a lot of uh, mistrust with the police, the justice, and the, the white society in general, and, and tension that create tension. I will give you, uh, Pia, uh, perhaps a um, few examples of different levels mm -hmm. where I think self-friendly police is important, and then we can build on that. The first one is regarding stop and procedures. That is very important, and we see that it can be um, uh, stop and procedures, and uh, uh, yeah, so stop and search procedures, sorry, um, can be uh, linked to uh, harassment, threats, insult, exploitation and even physical or even sexual abuse. And then of course that got a very uh, negative uh, pers perspiration on, from the child uh, on, on law enforcement. An example of that is perhaps uh, all the system where we have a proactive uh, policing model, a little bit like in the States where the police will act first uh, to search crime in a way you know you know uh, to um it's a it's a preventive measure which bring that children are actually um labelized stigmatized by by the police before even they act uh, if they wanted to act another example is um is the police interview in questioning this is very important um because we see that uh, the police doesn't have 
uh, don't don't have uh, enough information about uh, children rights in general so and they do not inform children about their rights uh, they proceed often without the um, without the presence of a parent or guardian or even a legal counsel which is in a lot of country all over the world totally illegal um Another another point is about um, the question of custody. Yes, custody and detention. Um, and then we see that uh, in some countries, uh, children may be detained in police custody for hours, even days, but without any um, adapted safeguards to the mm. according to child rights convention. Um, they can be in a, a very um, a bad condition uh, without access to uh, say, um, uh, sanity, uh, toilet, etc. in very overcrowded condition as well. And above all, detained with adult, which is a higher risk that they can have um, uh, when they are into the um, uh, the justice system. So that increase the risk of violence. So you see all of that are little steps uh, which bring that the child in his first or her first contact with the police starts to get a mistrust with all the system in general, which will be the root of all the tension in the future because we mm -hmm. are not clever enough to invest in this first part. Thanks, Cedric. I am... I, um... We certainly are hearing uh, uh, continued, it's not a new issue, but continued um, reports about negative experiences uh, from the police for, for street connected children specifically. Um, and it feels, if anything, it almost feels like it's getting worse in some locations, um, but it'd be really interesting to get a sense from you about are you seeing a increased frequency of negative experiences from children from marginalized backgrounds in interacting with law enforcement? Do you see it getting better? What's the what's the kind of global trend and and what are you seeing and what do you see as some of the key reasons for that? Yeah. Um so it's interesting because at the same time, you have the feeling that there is more and more training, there is more and more international standards, and people are aware. Um, but as we will say often in our world, in human rights world, he has the tendency to stay at a higher level and never get down, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, there is an increase uh, all over the world, an increase in, in negative experience for children when they are in contact with uh, the police. For many reasons. I mean, the, the, we know that as well, the police got less, um, you know, is that the financial crisis everywhere and above all on, 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 on social work, let's say it like that. So of course, uh, when you will have to cut somewhere at the, at the police level in terms of budget, you will cut the social worker perhaps first before to cut on, uh, online, um, uh, you know, online, uh, um, attack or, or whatever, or international uh, crime, etc., which are important as well, and we know the reality of our world at the moment, which is overcomplicated. But what's what, what the consequences of that is that we see that there is um, in in some decision taken, there is like more and more children getting in contact with the justice system for very bad decision taken. An example is what we call the school to prison pipeline. And that is pipeline is coming directly from the fact that you might have a government who decide that we will tackle crime at school and bad behavior of children, because, you know, children are always bad behavior, you know, from, from the beginning of the uh, origin of uh, our society, the following generation in the worse than the, the one pre previously, you know. Uh, so stupid ideas like uh, bringing a, police, a policeman into a school. So what are the consequences of that? You don't bring the policeman in a school of um, um, wealthy parents, no. You bring the policeman in a school for um, families from a marginalized background. So the school will have, the, the police person will have an eye of what everything uh, happening at school. And every day at school, something, something stupid is happening because children during the process uh, of developing, they do, they try, they do things, you know, some are serious, some are not, you know, we should not treat everything as the same, the same way. But what is happening is that 
in those schools where a police person is uh, the referent, they will have a look on what is happening. So they will have uh, a, an over an overlook on, on on pity pity offenses, you know, and with harsh disciplinary measures, with um, um, you know like uh, organizing search at school. Um, organizing um, this kind of measures, discipline measures and policies which bring uh, children in contact with the justice system when actually uh, they should have not, you know. Mm. We saw as well another example um, on, on that, we saw as well um, that there is an increase in some countries on the police initiated, uh, initiated stops for children. We knew that was a case uh, for um, uh, in adult and young adult, but more and more, uh, more and less, every time um, we see a higher number of very young children, like from 13 to 15, uh, that have been stopped by the police to be searched. And that is something quite new. Um, mm -hmm. And give you some number, like uh, um, in New York, only New York State, and from 2004 to 2012, uh, and the total number of 20, uh, 200 thousand um, uh, stopped by police for children from 13 to 15. Those children normally should not be in contact with the police. And then the last one is um, for the less marginalized children, I will say, in a way, it's all the example I was giving before, you know, all those action Friday for the future, uh, those march of children, etc. peaceful, meaningful, but they are criminalized in a lot of countries and arrested um, everywhere, everywhere in our democracy. Um, recently, Greta, in in your country, Pia, uh, but in 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 Brazil, few uh, few um, years ago, they've been arrested. Uh, hundreds of kids been arrested because they were demonstrated for um, uh, on 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 the subject of climate change. You know. Thank you. And and just sort of take it, you, you've kind of taken us through some of the things that go wrong um, uh, and, and where it can, you know, yeah. bring, bring police into schools. So let, let's flip it. If we were to flip it around and say, what are examples of effective practices uh, demonstrating child friendly policies and particularly how do you adapt them? to the most marginalized children. Street connected children are have the lowest levels of trust in the adult world. They are the most marginalized. They're the most likely to often behave in ways that will yeah. cause the police to react in ways they shouldn't. So 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 if we flip it around, what where does where do you see practice that's positive and that's working? Yeah, so I can just give you like um some example of um, of um, countries. So we did this research, and I will after uh, after we speak, I will share with uh, with your group um, this paper on child friendly police that we we did uh, two years ago, where we tried to identify some uh, promising practices. You know, nowadays we don't speak anymore about good practices, but promising practices, um, which are very interesting. So I will give you some example of countries, and of course, very happy to dig on that with you after. Um, so on the initial police interaction and arrest, uh, there is an interesting uh, practice in uh, in New Zealand where the num the arrest of children is restricted to specific circumstances. So that means that the police could not arrest anybody when they want. They have to have a warrant for arrest for sure. And then it could be only if uh, it's uh, for court appearance or preventing further offenses, you know, in, in the context of uh, reoffending, for instance, or pr pr protecting as well evidence of witnesses. So, you know, very specific cases in the context of the um, initial police interaction and arrest. I will give another example. Um, um, I will start with uh, with Philippines, um, because Philippines started to work on diversionary project uh, from the police level. But that is a new tendency that is developed a little bit everywhere, you know, diversionary measures, 
um, by the police before to get into the, the, the court system. So for, for our, our colleagues today, we are not really familiar with that. The, diversion, the idea of the diversionary measures is to divert the child from the justice pipeline. So it's an alternative to court level. So the kids will be referred to a program outside the justice system uh, by decision of the police. And in some countries, the police will have to inform someone as a judiciary, but that will depend on the, uh, the system. So for instance, Philippines is developing that, Thailand is developing that, et cetera. But the, the matrix will be behind that. The, the One of those, I will say, model countries, certainly uh, the Netherlands, who've been doing uh, um, you know, uh, the, those diversionary practice in the 60s, I think, if I remember, there is a wonderful organization. I, I do the promotion all the time because they're doing a wonderful job called HALT. HALT means stop in uh, in Dutch. Um, and that's my old knowledge in Dutch. Huh? Um, but um, but they what they do is exactly what I say. So that when the police arrest uh, a child after committing a uh, an offense. They, the child is directly diverted to a uh, HALT, this association, to um, go through a, a, a program. Uh, of course, the child needs to recognize that he's guilty, uh, that is for sure. And then, um, and then um, it will depend on the level of crime. Of course, if it's uh, a homicide, it's uh, something different. Um, on police custody and detention, you know, there is. Um, there is other country. I will take the example of Uganda to 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 move from another continent. Uh, in 2000, they had a Children Act where they developed a child and family protection unit in every major police station, and they provide uh, counseling um, for children after arrest or caution, and they promote as well diversionary measures when it's possible, always involving parents or guardians. So you know th that's something in the tendency of those uh, recommendation we had. Um, uh, an interesting, an interesting um, uh, practice in UK is the appropriate adult, uh, which I think is a very good thing, where the police cannot question a child without the presence of an adult, which can be a social worker or someone from the family, etc. In Ireland, they are used to have, I, I'm, 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 I don't know now, but they used to have the referee. So for instance, if a child commits um, an offence, they will have only one single um police officer during all their life in a way so um they will come back to uh, if they recommit if they commit an uh, is there a real fund sorry and they will meet again this police um, officer then of course if there is tension they can change no there is not um it's uh, only for the good not for the bad it's not uh, it's not a, a marriage um but uh, uh yeah uh, so some example like that but no, that was that was great and maybe we we wanted to kind of give this sort of uh, you know uh, around half an hour of, of us talking but then yeah, we wanted yeah. to, to engage with others but before i before i hand over and let others fire questions to you you know we we, we have in our network some of them have been able to join us today and some i know will watch this later on we have a few members of our network who who work really deeply in this area of working with with children in conflict with the law um etc and i know we've got one person from from pakistan on the call today who, who would fit that example but many other members of our network work more broadly with 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 children on the street they they've you know they do interact with the police inevitably it is it is it cannot but be part of a street social workers kind of burden of work because it, it's just a reality so if you had a chance to to kind of leave one thought with those organizations who work generally with children who have these interactions with the police and maybe they have an opportunity to talk to decision makers either at the municipal level or maybe even at the national level what what what's the one thing that you would or or two things that you would say I'd really it would be amazing if you thought about this or if you did this or if you messaged this. What would be your your kind of top of your kind of if you like call to action to members of our network? Yeah, I mean uh, yeah, that's a difficult a, question. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I you know what? Um this is a tricky question because you can answer this question from the different different perspective, right? 
I will say that coming from the justice system, we always see the world through the, um, the, the perspective of children's rights, right? And we always communicate through that perspective, the right of children. I'm going to be a little bit pessimistic now, but I have the feeling that our world at the moment is um, not that well, as you can see a little bit everywhere. And then, and then the experience that we had from COVID is that in a way, when there is emergency, the right of people can go on the second phase, right? So with that, I mean is um, that um, speaking children rights as first might not have the same impact than 15 years ago, unfortunately. I have the feeling that people are less uh, aware or interested, or they think that again about their children's rights. It's because we put everything under this, 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 this box, rights, right? Um, that, that, that potentially they don't know because they never learn about it. And that is for the police station, for the police, I mean, uh, staff is, is for sure. I never been in a country where I saw in ish, initial training any information about children's rights. Nothing, uh, even when you get to the higher level, like a chief officer, etc. Um, human right, perhaps a little bit, but children rights, nothing. So I will say that an advice for our colleagues here to be practical. Um, I will focus a little bit more on neurosciences in a sense to give some tools to a practitioner. If you scream to a child which is vic victim uh, or uh, who has trauma, you will not get what you want. If you speak to a, a child-friendly manner to a child, is the best way to get to the information you need to get your job done, blah, 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 etc. But you know, trying to give to to, in a way to um, put a fancy dress on 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 rights explains through the brain development of the child, that will give so many tools to a uh, um, you know to a, a police person when they are in contact with their children or to speak to them or to communicate. They have no idea about um, you know why a child will not answer a question. It's because the child sometimes they're so afraid they can't speak. They not they just not arrogant. They can't, you know, or they or they have multi trauma that we can't imagine, you know. Especially our children, our migrant children coming through all Europe and 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 all, all over the world and going through all many cases of abuse and neglect. They are victim first. They are victim first. Um, mm. So so I will say that perhaps. This is not a political um, recommendation that I give. It's much more a practical one, um, because I think that our policymakers, they already have the, all the information they need to make a good decision. They don't want to make it. So I think that we need to act ourselves. And then if we need to act ourselves, is to speak people to people. I really think that we need to bring the information people to people. So if you work, and I speak to the audience now, if you work with with some policy uh, police members, give them some advices of that on on brain science, on development of the child, etc., and they will understand perhaps better why they need to act as international standard recommend. I try. Yeah, that's, to that's fantastic. Thank you, Cedric. And 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 you know, I I think it two two thoughts that really occur to me listening at, at that final wrap up you did one is how so much of the work we do with the police or with schools or with uh, uh access to health actually there's a lot of cross learning we need to do so for instance we've just finished some research on uh, access to health and one of the key issues to emerge from talking to children and their organizations was the power of an appropriate adult which is something we hear about in the justice system but that's the first time i've heard it used in terms of navigating the health system but similarly uh -huh. we've got some wonderful members of our network who've been doing great work on trauma-informed approaches in the education system which i think as you're saying you could really take those approaches 
and apply them to some of the existing training that many members of our network do with police. And there is some brilliant practice. I think some of the bridges that have been built last year at our network forum, we heard about great work that had been done in, um, in Bangladesh, in Barisal, um, with uh, identifying that, that there wasn't a child-friendly focal point, even though it was set by law in Barisal in, in the police services. Children worked to make that point to the police that was identified. They worked to train that person. It was very practical and it was very much not a sort of uh, a highfalutin, a confrontational or, or give us, it was very practical. You know, this is what would be really helpful to us as children to keep us safe. Um, so that's really helpful. Now I can see lots of comments around um, input. I think from, uh, from Lahore, it looks like from Samad on some of the connections in Pakistan. I can see we've got uh, Lindo from uh, from Durban. Welcome. Um, I'm trying to see where else we've got so we've got folks. It would be wonderful to have some questions from Cedric to those in the audience. So, does anybody have anything or or, or comments people would like to 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 make? Um, I can see there's a lot of agreement from the comments from Samad about some of what happens in Pakistan in terms of children in conflict with the law um, and issues around children being seen as equivalent to adults. Uh, policing being arbitrary, etc. So is there anyone who would like to come in with a, I can't believe we don't have anybody with a question for Cedric. So any questions from the audience? So there's a question um, from Harry in the Q&A. Great. Okay. So differing definitions in country to country for street connected children. With this in mind, how does the Global Initiative for Justice with Children advocate systematically for street connected children on an international level without there being a uniform um, uh, agreed definition for street connected children between countries? Uh, right, so um, there is two elements here. Um, um, we uh, recently joined a campaign on um, criminalization of poverty. And I think that is uh, certainly something very easy to understand for our policymakers because it's basically uh, a good definition of what we had behind, uh, you know. Uh, um, uh, you know, in the 90s, we had all those um, crime prevention strategy, uh, which tackled um, a young person from marginalized background. Uh, and the consequences of that was quite negative because he focused all the attention of the police on certain part of the town. And then, uh, you know, of course, you had a, a number, a higher number of children in in in, uh, in justice system at the at the end from those uh, part of the town because the police were there and they had to do their job. Uh, I think what is interesting now is is to think about on a different way now how to avoid criminalization of uh, marginalized people or to avoid criminalization of, uh, you know, um, people ex um, expressing their voice, you know. It's, it's all about making sure that uh, society uh, become more, uh, let's say, um, uh, positive with citizens rather than thinking about uh, um, from a, the, the negative perspective. So I will say that um, from your question, which is a, a, a very good question, but it's true that um, I'm not familiar, but Pia, perhaps you 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 can tell the you can precise, but I'm not familiar in in some specific definition. But there is different expression of a similar uh, phenomena, right? And that is what is important. And is where when I say sometimes you need to tackle the roots rather than 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 trying to figure out the um, to regroup like a, a target group under a definition. So that's why I like to, to work on that concept of criminalization of mm -hmm. a, a certain um, part of the population. Yeah, no, that's really helpful. And, and certainly, I mean, one of the things that has come up a lot in the work that we've been doing on the Legal Atlas has been around uh, loitering laws, often longstanding um, laws that were put in place in colonial times that have a disproportionate mm -hmm. effect and criminalize children for being out and 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 are, and are implemented in an extremely arbitrary um, way. 
There is a question from Smita, um, which is, uh, in recent years, there's been a change in different country laws on children in, in conflict. Uh, India, Kenya, Nepal. How do you think the new legislative changes can impact lives of street connected children? Or is there any data or reference on the impact? I assume this is changes in country laws on children in conflict with the law, I assume is the question. Is that right? <coughs> yes, Smita says yes. So I, I'm not sure if you're 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 up to date on that, Cedric, but but changes in the the legal framework of children in conflict with the law in India, Kenya, and Nepal. Um, and have, have you seen any impacts of that? So unfortunately, we are too early because I'm, I'm traveling to uh, India uh, in uh, December to train lawyers uh, on, on child justice and to, to see actually the, uh, the consequences of the, uh, of the act. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure on the result. I have to say that um, data monitoring on, in India, Kenya, and in, in, in Nepal, it's um, it's not at the best. Um, so it's it's difficult to have, um, let's say, uh, a kind of um, uh, yeah impartial um, uh, vision of uh, what was the consequences of the um, uh, low um, um, development, recent development. So yeah, I, I, in Kenya, I think if I remember well, it's quite recent. So um, so um, uh, I don't have a lot of information about the the, the result. But uh, you know, um, uh, yeah, I'm happy to have a look on that more when I go to India and come back to you uh, uh, after that, Smita. And Smita, maybe I can share. This isn't quite answering your question, but I think it's really relevant and it picks up on something that Cedric was talking about earlier. I've come back relatively recently from a trip to Nepal, where standard operating procedures were put in place for street connected children. So this isn't law around uh, children in conflict with the law, but it was around response to uh, street connected children. Um, it led to a lot more police uh, picking up children and uh, taking them to shelters. And certainly the street social workers who I met in Kathmandu said that, and this speaks to what you said, Cedric, about um, neurosciences, children's brains, how they develop. The street social workers who I spoke to said, it's not that everything was bad about that because it put in more resources and it meant that there was much greater efforts at family reunification, but it had some very, very, very clear and negative mm -hmm. impacts on the children. Mm -hmm. They were, became very aggressive. Street social workers who had never had problems going out, working with the children, engaging with them, trying to support them, making better choices in their lives, suddenly found themselves at the brunt of quite a lot of aggression from children because of the children's experiences with the police. And they found children carrying knives, which had never happened in the past. They started having to always work in pairs, which may have advantages for safeguarding, but was they were doing it because they were actually feeling under threat. So I think it's a really good example of um, sometimes perverse un uh, consequences of what was meant to be a well-intended response to the increased number of children on the street, which came out of the earthquake in, in Nepal. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thanks, mm -hmm. Mita. Maybe something that we can pick up. Um, I'm just looking to see if there are any other direct questions that have come up with the team. We were expecting to go on for about three quarters of an hour. I don't think there are any additional questions. So I don't know if you have any final parting thoughts, um, Cedric, before we close the call. It's been brilliant, brilliant being in dialogue with you. There's a question here from um, Lindo in the Q&A. Ah, oh, yeah. I've missed that. Sorry, I'm jumping between the chat and the Q&A. <laughs> so Lindo from Durban um, has asked us, what do you think can be done for the police to fully understand the concept of child-friendly practices? Well, it's brilliant. That's sort of picking up on your, your comment, Cedric especially with children who find themselves in conflict with the law because of because in many instances the police are the first contact so i think it's um i think it's picking up on what you were talking about of you know you were saying well sometimes if you go in with a rights approach you yep. can almost turn people off but there's so much work you can do to engage with the police and to change maybe their practice and how they see things yeah you know I, i'm 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 working quite a lot with um 
judges and magistrate schools all over the globe. Uh, and of course, because they are uh, judges and magistrates, they are aware of um, all the legislation, all the laws, etc. And they are getting trained um, uh, regularly on that, um, at initial and, and then uh, after. It uh, doesn't mean that we should not um, put pressure on uh, judges and magistrates to be trained. That's not what I'm saying. But there is an awareness no, uh, in, the, in the initial training. And I think that I'm wondering, um, I haven't started yet to, to, to think about what we can do with the police for that. But sometimes we just need a short module at initial training with the police, you know, just to take some elements on child development to start with. Start with child development and then from child development to go to children's rights, I would say, instead of starting on the other side. The problem that we have is um, when you speak about children's rights, we speak from um, a, a legal uh, language, which means that some professional, they are not that much connected to that, you know, social worker, police person, etc. So I will say that is important to adapt the way to express the right uh, in a different way, according to the, the professional. But I'm wondering if there is something we can do to work with um, training school, no? Not trying to train um, afterwards police person, but try to get from the initial uh, curricula. Most of them in most countries, they need to have at least few days of training. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> um, so we, we might be able to influence that a little bit, just to give some information. And I'm sure that plenty of them will be so interested um, to understand why kids are different, why if you speak uh, to them, you need to adapt this tactic and, and this one. I mean, there is some training that we are doing on, on you know, on um on vulnerabilities on gender etc yeah. so why not on kids and and cedric just just to reassure you there has been brilliant work done by members of our network doing exactly that so working with police training academies they do say that they sometimes have police who are very gung-ho when they're young and going into starting yeah. their work who find it harder to maintain it as they that go through true. but then they have other 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 members of the police who've kind of remained champions for this work as they've got more senior in the police force. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's something that we've seen done. Yeah, Latin America, India, Africa, some really, really great examples of, of doing that kind of training. I've got one more question before we close, which comes from Smita again, who's asking, is there any trend from countries on lowering the age of children for trying them under criminal laws? So I think this is around the age of uh, no, criminality, so yes. Um, yeah. Yeah, right. So, you know, the uh, general comment 24 of the Committee of the Rights of the Child uh, precise the previous general comment number 10 on juvenile justice. And uh, and the new one say that the age of 14 should be the uh, objective, the goal, um, as a minimum. So it's mean that if you, for the countries who are the age of 15, they have not been asked to reduce, right? Um, uh, it should not be <laughs> misunderstood. Uh, but that 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 got quite a, a strong influence, I have to say, uh, in policy uh, reform. And we saw a lot of countries that decided to rise their age of criminal responsibility. Um, so, um, so I will say that is um, is certainly going in a in a very interesting way. My fight at the moment. Um, will be on the other part of the age, the age of uh, adulthood, and what happened with young adult. I think mm -hmm. that will be my fight for the future, try to make sure that young person are still recognized as uh, in development, in a way, uh, in between, in a transition period between childhood and adulthood. And then you can't stop childhood at 18. Mm -hmm. And then even, from a scientific point of view, the, the 18 is not is not an age uh, of full development into an adult of a child. So I will say my fight now will be to ensure that we consider that child justice can still be applied after 18, as it is a case in plenty of countries, actually, Germany until 27, you know, 
and they almost don't have anybody in prison uh, because they have a lot of programs in the community. So it works. Super, super interesting and lots and lots of food for thought. Thank you, Cedric. Um, before we close and I'll do some housekeeping at the end, was there anything you wanted to, any final thought you wanted to leave, leave, leave us with? I wanted to thank you all um, for giving me this opportunity. It was a good opportunity for me to come back to this topic as well as I was been working a lot uh, in the rest, uh, recent uh, days on uh, systemic child participation in justice system, which can be uh, another topic of discussion in the future. Um, but I would say that um, what would be very interesting is um, for all of us to, that's something that I believe a lot, is to continue promoting restorative justice approaches uh, and then to make uh, a society, our society safer for everybody, foster the communication between the victim and the uh, offenders, and above all, uh, develop peace uh, in our countries. I think restorative approach always bring a, a positive message so that will encourage uh, um, all our participants to um, to have a look and see uh, if there is something that can be done uh, in your different countries to uh, to promote this um, philosophy. Thank you, Cedric. That feels like a very um, timely <laughs> finishing word in terms of what's happening in the world at the moment. And it does feel like a bit more of a restorative approach is what we'd all like to see happening. Um, particularly in the Middle East, but in many other parts of the world. Um, Ellie, are you able just to bring up our final slide so that I can take us through? So a huge thanks to Cedric. That was that was just exactly what we wanted. Um, really brilliant input. And thank you for the great questions from everyone and the engagement. So this is a perfect segue into our first session tomorrow morning, which is at 10 a.m. GMT. It's about law enforcement and street connected children, but very much from a practitioner perspective. And we're gonna get some very practical examples of the things we've been talking about today. I know there's gonna be discussion of trauma informed approaches of working with the police. There's gonna be ways of building bridges, et cetera. So I really encourage you to come and join that session. Um, and I think it takes everything Cedric said and it brings it into sort of practical application in our network. And then um, the next session after that tomorrow will be around um, positive parenting. So hopefully if we get that bit right, you get less children um, ending up on the streets and uh, and getting in conflict with the law. So, um, so all part of the uh, preventative um, approaches. So that's what we've got coming up next. I'd like to thank everybody for their time. Uh, and I know that we will continue to be working on this topic as a network because it is so important for us and the children that we work with. So thank you all. Have a great end of, uh, of your Mondays and um, see you tomorrow for the next session. Thank you, Cedric. Bye.